All of you know the epidemiology of uh, cardiac uh, coronary artery disease. In fact, I will talk more on atherosclerosis, and these are the few of the risk factors of which lipids, diabetes, family history. There are few which are very well known, but there are some which are not very well known. As for example, uh, some of the hemostatic factors, some of the thrombotic factors, behavioral factors, which we do not give much intention importance still today, and definitely inflammation. This is some new topic which at the moment looks more theoretical, but it seems that in the future it would have a lot of implications in many so-called lifestyle diseases, mainly atherosclerosis and related cardiovascular diseases. So, as he rightly said, coronary artery disease is number one cause of death, not only in developed countries, but even in India. And in, in, in India, at the moment, it's more than probably infectious diseases. And important thing is, it's a preventable. But if you don't pay attention, it's actually increasing. And that's the problem. That is, in fact, example of behavior and its impact. You know, this is 1990 pictures. You see what is TV, what is human being. And what is impact of behavior, you can see it today. So that is example of impact of behavior. So though our technology is progressing, unfortunately diseases are increasing. So we are not at the able to overcome all the diseases. Actually, in fact, if you see the profile in epidemiology 100 years ago versus now, the disease profiles have changed. The people dying in past because of tuberculosis are now dying because of AIDS or because of coronary artery disease. But the number one killer is the same instinct as it was centuries ago. Only thing it changes its character and its type. And these are the few of the risk factor causes. All of you know that. There is no need to go into detail. But there are some new factors that I am going to talk to you. <coughs> now see, uh, uh, we know these are all the common risk factors. Unfortunately, there are 20% people who develop coronary disease without any known risk factors. I am sure that all of you must have seen 40 or 35 year old young men coming with a heart attack and no known risk factors. Not even family history, no smoking, no obesity, nothing. And we still don't know why this thing happens because there must be some risk factors which are not known to us. Many people consider excessive amount of pollution or exposure to pollution is also one of the risk factors. But how it works, maybe it may have act through certain ways. That is what I am going to discuss. Even those patients who have high lipid profiles, it is one of the most high tests that people are doing. There are some patients who come to one each monthly with lipid profiles. And they always wonder if they get heart attack with normal lipid profiles. But you must know that lipid profile may be responsible only in 20 to 30 percent cases with a heart attack. And person can get heart attack with normal lipid profile. On the other hand, many people come in panicky mode with high lipid levels. They are so worried about the figures and the digits, but then we would tell them that don't worry. Lipids are abnormal that alone does not cause you heart attack. So issue is, we, uh, our, our society is sort of a fixation on the lipid profile, but that is not important. There are many patients with normal lipids, either to begin with or even after aggressive medical, still they get heart attack. And that is what is known as a residual risk factor. So my aim is to decide what are the factors which causes residual risk factors. And there are many studies here, it can show that if C-reactive protein is high, at any given level of lipid, it increases the chance of coronary artery disease. Of course, more the lipid level, more this level, there is more chances of development of this problem. And this can be indicated by uh, American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association recommendations. In 2003, that CRP should be done in some of the patients to assess the risk factors. But now in 2013, they said it is much more important to decide high risk patient for atherosclerosis cardiovascular disease. And now it's considered one of the part in the armamentarium of the laboratory to decide the risk of coronary disease. So importance of inflammation, indirectly you can see CRP is increased over a period of time. Now there are some of the slides which you may not understand unless you have to apply for the exam or unless there's some gold medal sitting, but we practitioners may not bother too much to go into detail about these slides. But these are the slides how inflammation is important as a pathogenesis or a pathophysiology of creating atherosclerotic plaques, lipid, lipid plaques and ultimately coronary events. As an example, if this is the upper one is the vessel lumen. Now whenever the activated uh, monocyte is activated and on the other end the LDL cholesterol, especially the small particle LDL cholesterol get activated, it is known as an oxidized uh, LDL and it acts as one of the very triggering factor for the atherosclerosis period, which in turn is triggered by the process of inflammation. And there are various type of pathways which you don't need to remember unless you have to appear for the exams or give to lecture. So uh, even I would even forget it after two days, so don't worry about remembering this complexity. But these are the whole two important pathways. One is nf kb pathway, which is responsible for mechanism which ultimately resulted in two development of atherosclerotic plaques and atherosclerotic coronary events. 
The other is sort of prophylactic pathway. Dendritic cell plays a role as a prophylaxis or prevention of atherosclerosis through what is known as canuric pathways. Now, at the moment, you think why we should understand, bother about undergoing these theories. But it is very surprising that if you know how this pathway takes place, how atherosclerosis takes place, you can find a lot of targets or a lot of areas where we can develop some medicines or where we can have some target whereby we either accelerate the process or decelerate the process. So suppose if you can find something which can suppress NF-KB pathway, you may suppress the process of atherosclerosis or even prevent it. On the other hand, if you can find something which stimulates the canuric pathway, it is possible that we can again reduce atherosclerosis process because this canuric pathway is a more helpful pathway. So as for example, if NF-KB pathway is activated, it results into inflammatory mediator development like TNF factors or interleukin, etc, etc, which in general produce adhesion molecules and few other molecules which can result into initiation of plaque formations or acute coronary events. I am not going to very much detail, but just, just superficial examples. As well, if canuric pathway is activated with the help of again trigger, it can result into formation 3 HHA, which is sort of helpful or it's a defense mechanism by inflammatory markers. So these are the two pathways on two different sites. I am not going to very much detail about this. As for example, this is NFKB pathway. Whenever there is any type of inflammatory stimulation, which could be many things like high level of cholesterol itself is considered as inflammatory stimuli. Many of the pathogens can be considered like inflammation. There are certain organisms where are considered to be inflammatory. Even pollution, certain level of certain gas or acids in the body also can act as an inflammation. So this all can activate this NFKB pathway. And when this pathway is activated, it results to translocation of uh, NFKB pathways or uh, molecules into the nucleus in which it causes release of inflammatory mediators. There are a lot of a whole number of inflammatory mediators as for example TNF is tissue necrotic factor or interleukin. There are H, H, S, C, R, P. C, R, P may be either marker or it may be positive. We don't know at this moment. So these are the examples which result into ultimately inflammatory reactions. And this is one molecule which is known as QQ, which at the moment is not available in medical form, but in future it would be available. And that is probably going to act at various levels of this particular pathway. So it can inactivate this particular pathway. So if you can find some medicine like this which actually act at this level, it may suppress the process of inflammation. So it can prevent activation of this pathway. It prevents last location of a molecule into the nucleus and can release inflammatory mediator. So all three levels, it can probably prevent atherosclerotic process. And theoretically and practically, there are few studies which show its role as anti-inflammatory. In turn, it can prevent or suppress atherosclerotic process. The another pathway is KY uric pathway, which actually is activation of or formation of 3-HHA from tryptophan with the help of various pathways as I mentioned. Actually, nicotinamide was one of the medicines, but it actually didn't show as much effect. But still, if you can find some medicine like 3 hha it may have some anti-nitronic action or can reduce in the LDL formation. This is an example of the molecule 3-HAA. And these are some of the studies which shows its effect on plasma lipid levels and how it affects our inflammation. I am not going to detail because these are more research-related uh, slides, which is difficult to understand otherwise. But in summary, you can say 3-HAA is an intermediate product from tryptophan and it has some clinical significant benefits as for example, inhibition of atherosclerotic lesions, beneficial effect on liquid metabolism, especially reduction in VLDL, chylomicrons and increases HDL level. Actually, these are many benefits of pleiotropic actions or pleiotropic effects and ultimately it can reduce vascular inflammation, atherosclerosis and related sequences. There are many other molecules like this which are at the moment targets for research. As for example, these are the long list, how it acts, which are the pathways, which are the possible ways and how it works. This is uh, really going to be innovation in next few years. And we may not pay attention at this level. Maybe after 10 years you realize, oh, this was something which, is, which has played a big role. So at the moment, despite optimum therapy with current drugs that we have, which is mainly aspirin, other anti uh, platelet agents, statins, and other agents to reduce the NDL, Still one third of the patient or the one third of the low risk patient develop coronary artery disease and we don't know why they develop it. So tackling inflammation may provide potential answer to improve the coronary artery disease and cardiovascular outcome. That is what our hope is. 
and ultimately control of information may reduce corona diseases in future. <coughs> now see, you are all 80 percent. How many of you are research, active research? I think majority of you are clinicians at this moment. So I am sure that we are all clinicians and we get really bored because we won't understand. Don't worry, even I didn't understand too much about this lecture. But I had to read it two times so I understand a little bit. Now what, what is, how this can actually affect our practice or the way we can think? Do you think it can have any importance? Can you recognize these kids? Just just give me an example of who are these kids. Very good. Lata Mangeshkar, very good. Very good. And Amir Khan, Lata Mangeshkar. Yes, yes, very good. I think that was very good. Very good. And the first one, that you should be able to do. Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi. Is that that's the girl? So we are not expert people here. <laughs> good, good. Now see, what I have to say is, when they are kids, you don't understand what is that potential. The same is true as far as basic research is concerned. You feel, oh, this is something, you don't, you don't pay attention to it. But you don't know what is the implication after 10 years, 20 years. So this would have changed the life in significant ways. These are the kids who are very well known personality now. But when the kids, no one knows what is their potential. And that is exactly what is going to be true as far as this basic research is concerned. Yeah. And just give some example in cardiology research. Like when sirolimus came or pectinexal came as an antibody agent, we never bother what it could be. But you know what is its role in cardiology at the moment? They are used to drug protestants. So all the drug protestants they work more because of this uh, antibody or uh, static drugs which prevents new antibody hyperplasia. So this is an example of implication of some basic research. And people realize what is the way, way, the way in which it acts and how it can be implemented into something entirely different. Same is the role of AC inhibitors, beta blockers, antiplatelet agents, uh, medicines which prevent thrombosis or antithrombotic agents, etc., etc. So this is the we are seeing the fruitful results of the basic research which was done many many years or even decades ago. As for example, you see this pathway. If someone would have shown show you this pattern 30 years ago, you would not pay attention to it. But today we realize that this basic path has turned into a big breakthrough in medical history. Similarly, see there is a lot of progress in cardiology. On one side you see the basic research and we often don't pay much attention because we are the clinician who are responsible or interested in only end results. We don't want anything the way it is. We are like Mundabai. We don't want to find out how many bones are there in the body. We just want to break them. So that is the same thing as clinicians and basic research. But today you can see that Huge basic research has resulted to a tremendous advance in cardiac Example for the upper one, can you say what is this upper one here? An ASD closer device. You can close the ASD hole percutaneously without surgery. Just in one hour under local anesthesia. It's a huge innovation. Similarly, this is the CID device which can improve the cardiac function in a patient who has severe airway dysfunction. 30 years ago when the first pacemaker was built, it was so huge as uses this big room and patient to remain tied down to the pacemaker machine for the whole life if he wants to live alive. And then the machine was made small, it was a small battery with a wheelchair, the patient could go out actually with the machine, it was a miracle. But now we realize it was a small machine which you can implant. And what is the future? It is only a small machine which is litless. So this is an example of how innovation takes place. Few years ago when the first ECG was invented and it came to India in Gujarat actually in 1955, there was only one or two ECG machines. People were surprised, how can you diagnose heart attack with the help of that machine? It was a big miracle that time. But now ECG, no one even think it's a miracle, but it is a miracle actually. In future, you can have artificial pancreas, which is what is going to happen in many, many years ago. So these are the examples of progress just right from very early days of uh, open heart surgery to a leadless pacemaker. This is a very small leadless pacemaker, only this much size, which you can put percutaneously, unscrew it, and only small patient remains there. So there's no pacemaker here, no wire here, it's going to be made. Actually, it has come into practice. Similarly, that one is a mitral clip. You can actually repair mitral valve. Of course, not all mitral valves, not, not all leaks, but there are certain leaks which can be repaired at degree of MR can be used by two grades. So you can avoid surgery and impact uh, very positively as patients are concerned. The main problem is how to bridge the gap between basic science and applied science. The lecture I gave was on basic science. I am not the right person to talk on basic science because my knowledge in basic science is practically zero. There are more people, uh, what do you call, people who can give better lecture like Dr. Lakhai for example, on basic research or my gurus like Prakasha and Kokusha. But I, I took that opportunity because they gave me that opportunity. So I just tell you how to reduce the gap. Now, so Rudyard Kipling once said, East is waste is waste. 
and you cannot make them simple. Same is true as far as basic science, research science, and clinics are concerned. They are very different people. Their ball game, their thinking, everything is entirely different. So you know what are the difference between the two? There are very few people who can be both. As for example, basic science. A people who are basic scientists, they are more into hypothesis <coughs> theories, yeah. and they spend days and nights in yeah. books and laboratories. Often don't come out. They often don't come in contact with other human beings because they come in contact with rats and cats, but they don't come in contact with other human beings. And but then uh, people know them thousands and hundreds of miles away, but their neighbor may not know them. On the other hand, we clinicians, we are loud mouth, we are seen in the society, but we are not known outside our own city. But at least in our city, we are known people, and right? people know he's a doctor, so and so, etc., etc. But our dream is fame, prestige, money, money, and money, and more money. And what is their dream? Research people want Nobel Prize. Their dream is very different. And when you see the research, it's not simple. We just get end result tablet, just give it to the patient before we are a great doctor. But actually, thousands of hours and manpower and everything has gone in research and there are multiple stages of research, right from the conceptual stage or discovery stage to a long preclinical history, clinical stages, again phase one, two, and three, and then until it comes to the practice. And what research we do is only usually post-approval research and see whether it works or not. That's all we do actually. This example how vaccine was developed and how the stages from basic research to clinical trial. You know Dr. Jonas Sack, he was a person who invented a polio vaccine and unlike other people he didn't take any uh, monetary gain or he said he doesn't want to uh, take a patent for this because he wanted for the use of human society. In real sense, he has far more impact on human life than any of the politicians you can ever think of it. Because of his research, lakhs of kids have been spared from polio as for example. So, Research scientists have much more impact on human well-being than any of the politicians. Whatever lecture they give it, whatever publicity they do it, you can't compare these people. But they are the real gurus and the real swamis that we should really respect. To. Unfortunately, in spite of that, there is a big gap that exists between the basic cardiology science and practice. I am sure in orthopedy also there must be some gap like this. And this gap occurs because of multiple reasons like time lag, time lag for example, between knowledge and its application or lack of knowledge. We don't know that something is going taking place at some place. Or inability to apply that particular knowledge. Because you know that little space, space is there, but the cost is too much, or that particular expertise is not there. Or there is wrong applications, or wrong interpretation, which is very common actually. Or unnecessary extrapolation of the knowledge. That if one group of medicine works, it means everything works, which is not true. That is what we consider. Or our own weakness, our own greed, or our own personal motto, etc., etc. This is just an example of one thing. You know there is escalator. Nathan Ames invented in 1859. But it took so many years before it becomes more publicized. Why? Because one day, people were very scared. Whenever you put this in uh, one of the big uh, exhibition, people were so scared that he thought nobody is now going to go there. So what he did, he asked one man, man with one leg and asked him, you go up and down and give you some money. So people will see even person with one leg can go up and down, we can easily go and down. So that will remove the fear. And then he was listening in the corner to see what is the reaction of people. You know what was the reaction? One child wanted to go up and his mother said, don't go otherwise you will get one leg like this. So that delayed it for so many years. Similarly, there are many other good inventions. As for example, penicillin. Penicillin was a wonderful drug. But it has one or two side effects. And for that reason, it was not into the market for almost 10 to 15 years, and by that time, many people have died actually because of wound infection. And then, when penicillin came, it actually reduced mortality quite significantly. Same is true for the uh, <coughs> anti rabies or whichever uh, anti tetanus vaccine. You know, in first world, how many people died? One crore people died. And of this, about 2 to 3 lakhs people died because of tetanus, because of wound injury related tetanus. In Second World War, by that time, anti tetanus vaccine was introduced and only 11 people died because of tetanus. You can see the impact, 2 lakhs versus only 11. Unfortunately, total number of people died was 5 crore because weaponry also had progressed significantly. So that was a sad part as for example. So same is true as far as cardiology is concerned. That in 1912, James Herrick invented that, or rather discovered that atherosclerosis is the cause of heart attack. But it took us almost 50 to 70 years to develop medicines to act against atherosclerosis. Still, we have not overcome this particular His knowledge was in 1912, but his victory was probably almost 70, 80 years afterwards. So, how do you reduce this particular gap? There are various ways. As for example, we need dedicated doctors to take care of patients. But we have to have some people who are 
educated researchers and should not worry about emergency, critical ill patient, death, medical and other issues. And then only we can have a reduction in gap. And both clinicians should have some basic knowledge and they should have some clinical knowledge and there should be some common meeting or something like that. But I, I don't see any person from basic research here, but that should be there. And scientists must be encouraged to interact more with the clinicians and should visit hospitals, talk to the patient. They should not remain confined to the laboratories. Same way we, we should go and read books, but it's difficult for us to do that thing. And best way is a clinician research should join hands. Keep patient outcome in their mind, not income, but patient outcome in mind. And we must remember Hippocratic oath, not the hypocritical behavior, but Hippocratic oath. That will reduce the gap significantly. And I actually salute pharma industry because they play a very big role in bringing the research scientists and clinicians together and that can probably reduce this gap. And we can see what these pharma companies have done actually. And we actually clinicians must salute all the basic scientists because out of thousands of molecules only one molecule come to the practice and that is what we consider responsible for patients' actual recovery. But it is the research scientists who have paid thousands of hours and works and uh, really they have dedicated their life. So many people dedicate life and you find one particular one. It's like Zenetech has actually eradicated the need for the surgery for the gastric ulcers as for example. This is all because of basic research. And we doctors always feel we are God, but it is not true. We try to act like we are God, but remember there is research that has made us daily God actually. And we always feel that there is great progress, big and big hospital coming in place. And you consider that is a progress. Is it progress? Actually, more and more hospital coming is a more and more regress. It is not a progress. More hospital coming means medical industry is becoming more a medical profession becoming more industries, and that means our health is going down. So we should aim more at prevention rather than costly surgery or angioplasties and other things. Actual real progress is not big hospitals. Real progress is healthy society. And that is what we want. Happiness index should be high, not the wealth index. Happiness index should be high. Then all we can say there is a real society. And this is unfortunate sad event that in India, in spite of more and more hospitals coming up, more and more angioplasty, more and more bypass surgery, actual mortality of coronary disease is increasing. That indicates we are not actually progressing. Though, if you say only statistics, finance, it's a progress. But real sense, it is not. And once Arnold Toyin we said that humans survived better in jungles when human being was helpless without any weapons against wild animals. Then now when he has lethal weapons. Why? Because we kill each other far more effectively than it was before. You can see what happened in Paris or Middle East or whatever it is. And same way I would say that heart patient survival was probably better without aggressive cattle with weapons like balloons and stents. Actually many people die because of that procedure but we always feel we have done a great job. And I would insist that all of you should go for basic research once in a while. You don't know whether you are the next one aiming for the Nobel Prize or the billion or we don't know. Sometimes research can take you to an entirely different league. So always pay attention to research. At least think innovation. Talk to the pharma or the people who can make your idea practical. So I just concluded the last slide. That my humble wish is that basic research will progress so much that one day we will be able to do medicine which can prevent atherosclerosis like their polypill and coronary coronary disease and sequences can be practically avoided and same as redditidine has done for the neural ulcer in eradicated. So maybe 2010 or 2100, 22nd century books of medicine may say that in old days doctors were so rough and rude that they were doing some crude methods of plumbing poor patients clog arteries with blowing balloons and destroying, deploying the stents as if they are cleaning a gutter. Let this be a past and then it's real history and real progress actually. So we must thank to the innovation in pharma industries like Scandilla has done it, that just take one or two pills and will prevent atherosclerosis and its consequences and I think that is what we really wish and we hope that all the hardware stand and balloons should be in the medical museum. Then we can call it real progress and real history. So I just stop it here because I know that we are already